What is happening to American farms and ranches? 2,500 go on the block every week. What are their chances for survival? Welcome to U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area and others interested in having American agriculture receive cost of production plus a reasonable profit. The American farmers and ranchers are building a brighter future for agriculture through the National Farmers Organization, the organization that awoke America and represents the leadership of agriculture. U.S. Farm Report now presents as special guest Ken Stoffern, Director of NFO Field Staff Department, and Leroy Kanas, NFO Field Staff Assistant. Here to do the questioning is W.W. Butch Swaim, Director of NFO Public Information. Ken, I know that you're over a large area of the United States now and have many, many field men in the field. Why don't you tell us just a little bit about that before we get into the rest of the program? Well, thank you, Butch. Uh, I think, number one, I think uh, our listening audience might be interested that the National Farmers Organization has had the most phenomenal growth in the last uh, year and a half that I think uh, doesn't even compare to anything historical precedent. Uh, I think that we can say that uh, we've grown faster than probably any other comparable uh, organization or any kind of movement whatsoever in the same uh, patterns. We're in 45 of the nation's continental states now, and by the end of this season, uh, we're going to be in all productive areas of all 48 continental states. So I think this is testimony in itself from what it was a year ago when we were in about 28 or 29 plus some membership in Alaska, Ken, because right recently they signed up a former uh, California farmer that now farms in Alaska, and I don't know whether you know or not, but they took material back that he was going to start working in Alaska. Yes, I understand that. This happened here just about uh, three or four weeks ago, as I understand. So uh, we're having a, a good season in uh, organizing farmers and ranchers clear across the United States, and I think they're all recognizing that uh, collective bargaining for agriculture, the NFO way, is the answer. That's the main thing that they understand, because we have inquiries from all over the nation. Now. I think probably our listening audience would be interested in uh, the Farm Journal March issue, uh, Central Edition, where in there, it says, farms, 2,500 go on the block every week. What are your chances for survival? Well, your chances are multiplied many times when you belong to the National Farmers Organization because in that bargaining program is a better life for agriculture families and a better life in the bargain. And uh, we've had uh, a lot of response from all over the nation uh, as to the NFO's collective bargaining program it's not philosophy anymore. We're actually doing it and putting it into practice, bargaining on commodities, and it all comes as a result of uh, organization, which has to come first because you don't solve your problems and then organize. It has to come the other way first, Butch. Uh, why is it, Ken, that more young men are not starting in farming? Well, I think the answer, Butch, lies in uh, probably a graph that I have here. Where, where we can show the uh, investment in agriculture, which right now, in 1967, as of this figure here, was $269.5 billion, uh, versus 1960 at 203.5. And down here is really the answer where uh, net farm income is shown from 1960 at less than $12.5 billion and on up uh, and stabilizing here and following the uh, investment a little bit when you get to 66 and then downward again in 1967 where they show an investment of about $14.6 billion, but that includes all of the uh, government payments and also many other things as far as uh, charging off rental to uh, farm dwellings to farmers and uh, all of the foods that they eat out of their gardens and farms and whatnot. So. You mean return, not investment, didn't you? you That's said right. Investment. Leroy, uh, you had a chart here a while ago about all the empty farm homes in America. Yeah, I haven't have it here yet, but I think this is <clears throat> self 
self-evident, anybody driving through the community, uh, in view of the fact that in the last 15 years, about uh, just about 50% of the farmers have been forced off of the land due to low farm prices and increased investment in agriculture. As to the last graph, in the last 15 years' time, in the ni about 1950 to 52, then farmers were receiving about 15% return on their investment. Whereas in, uh, and they were borrowing money at that time for farm loans for about 4%. Whereas now a $14 billion return on a $269 billion investment, only 5.5%, and farm operating money is costing seven. So you can't hardly expect young people to go into these farm homes when it's even a poor investment for the ones that are already in farming. When you get enough empty farms, you get empty store buildings on Main Street, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a ratio. It has been figured and computed that uh, for every 10 to 12 farmers that go off of the farm in a community, one store or one business place has to close. Therefore, you don't only have the influx of the, the farmers into the uh, met metropolis of the city, but also from your small towns in the farming communities. Now, another one you had there was empty schools and churches and the whole thing. It all goes together, right? Yes, it definitely does. I know many of the areas, they have adequate facilities to uh, uh, educate the children, but uh, no need due to the fact that there aren't any children in the area. So you run into school consolidation in order to maintain the curricular that uh, the people want their children to have. Now, uh, my home area, I know it's uh, president, my home state of South Dakota, they already have the design mapped out according to the exodus of the p people from the rural community that uh, by 1980, I believe it is, or somewhere in that vicinity, they intend to educate the high school pupils in 14 high schools for the state. And as the schools go, so go the churches. Uh, it was interesting uh, to note that oh, about a month, six weeks ago, I attended a meeting. The churches in the rural community are becoming concerned, and they had computed some statistics uh, through this area right here around Corning in southwest Iowa and come up with the, the fact that in the next 15 years, 50% of their parishioners are going to be dead because of the high age that they run today. In other words, this doesn't necessarily have to be true. I mean, this is what's predicted for us if we don't do something about true. it. True, if it but follows the trend. A, you put an income out here in agriculture comparable to the rest of them, where the man can get cost of production plus a reasonable profit with a reasonable return on his investment. The young folks will be doing the farming. The schools will be filled up with children. The older folks will retire instead of the old folks trying to do the farming. Ken? Uh, we talked a little bit about yours, the increased net farm income, the increase in uh, income. Uh, this is the thing that we must have in order to bring this about to keep the young folks out here in agriculture. That's right, Butch, and it's pointed out here on a graph where, where it was computed what it would require to get farm prices at 100% parity under today's uh, formulas. And it would require an extra fifteen billion dollars in the gross farm income as compared to what is being received today which would bring the gross farm income to a total of fifty seven point eight billion well as you can see now that our figures were forty two point eight billion last year which gave the agriculture a net cash income of only eight billion now that's not including government payments or any of the charges against rental or consumption of farm products. But there's something interesting here, and that is the costs of production amounted to $34.8 billion, and we subtract that from $42.8 billion, which give us then, on the uh, sale of agriculture production, just $8 billion, where the USDA pointed out 14.6. But we think it's been padded just a little. We know it has. And figuring the investment in this $8 billion figures only 3% return on the investment from the sale of farm commodities. Now, uh, you had another one there about gross farm income, gross versus the net. Can you cover that one for just a little bit? Yes, I think I probably did already, Bunch, but uh, in addition to that, what we want to point out here is the effects of uh, higher farm prices 
would have as far as the consumer is concerned. Now, this is very interesting because people think that a corresponding rise would result to the consumer if you had an increase in farm income, which is not true. Because right now, the farmer's share of the consumer's disposable income is only 5%, and the consumer is paying now 15.5. Uh, well, 35% increase in farm products only amounts to 1.7, which is added on is 15.5 is 17.2, so the consumer will still have a break in his food prices. I know that many times they've told us that if we get our price up, the other fellow's price will just go up and it'll go right on up. I know, Leroy, you and I know this isn't true, and you have a chart there about stabilizing the economy. Let's go into this thoroughly so that the people will understand once and for all that it takes better farm prices to stabilize the rest of the economy. It definitely does, Butch, and it reflects right back to the last picture we were showing in consumer costs. It, uh, I know a lot of people would think you were crazy, perhaps, if you said that if the price of food goes up and the farmers get a fair return for their production, that they will have more money to spend for other things other than food, but you actually do because of the employment that agriculture creates. But I'd like to go to the position we're in now as unorganized farmers in a what-will-you-give-me market. Uh, every time that labor or industry takes an increase in profits or wages, uh, Farmers being in no position to offset this by pricing their products get squeezed tighter and tighter. This actually creates a spiraling economy, or inflation, in simple words, because a spiral is created when two ends don't meet. If one works toward the center and the other toward the outside, that you have a, a farther division. And so what you have to do is establish uh, agriculture in a pricing position so that as labor moves forward, industry moves forward, and agricult so agriculture then too can price its product on an equal basis, then everybody has the same size piece of pie, so to say. And if farmers receive the share that they're supposed to have, a man that's working, just throwing out a figure of speech now, a man who's working 35 hours a week and taking home $100 and is spending $17.5 for food, we would require his services to work 40 hours a week. Therefore, with the same wage scale, he would take home 120, but it would cost him about 20 or $21 for food, which would still give him about 17 or 18 more dollars to spend for other things than food. In other words, he would have more full employment. He could buy more food than he does now and still have money left, right? Absolutely. Now, a lot of people think perhaps that by pricing farm products that you would continue to go around and keep this wheel going around. Well, anything that meets itself coming in the back door soon quits following it. Right. So well, you'd, you'd level, level off. In other words, the merry-go-round that we're on now would stop and settle down to a sound economy of earned income instead of a debt-fueled economy that we have today. Absolutely. Now, uh, show us about the pricing structure here, your opinion of what it takes to correct it. Well, I think uh, that's self-evident in uh, this graph. Now, we're not condemning any business here. But uh, as you see on this side, a product that is manufactured is priced at the manufacturer level, and profit plus cost is moved on clear through to the consumer level. And everybody derives their share, or what is needed. Now on the opposite side, in farm production, you see a split arrow with part of it going up and part of it going down. And this is actually where your problem comes into your economy. This is your division which forces one end down and the other end up. And this is why we're in the inflationary position that we are today. It has actually come about in the last 20 to 30 years when a small nucleus of people got into a position to price the products to the consumers through your retail chains. They're buying cheap and selling dear, and as long as we stay unorganized, they will be in this ratio. An interesting item came over the UPI wire here about two weeks ago. I believe it was a four-part of February, three weeks ago, and it was that economists were giving a report that uh, in a supply and price situation, the American consumer was going to pay about 2.5% more for their cost of living this year for food, and farmers, in spite of the fact that they were going to produce more, were going to take less total dollars. Well, that's right here at this breaking point in this arrow. In other words, the farmer was going to produce more for less the consumer was going to buy a little more, and he was going to pay more. For each item. Right. Very true. So 
If we don't put a stop to this, we're all going out of business together. Absolutely. The consumer and the farmer. Another point I would like to comment on in here is uh, uh, people assuming that you can't get a price for farm products because of surplus. Well, one instrument in here is that every step on an arrow that is moving upward, any supply they have is carried as inventory. But when you start from the retail food outlet and they start pricing it downward toward the farmer, at that point, the processing industry or the hog buyer or the farmer, if he has 1% more, at that point, they consider it a surplus. So the, actually, the changing of the pricing system turns surplus to inventory. Right. Don't you have another chart there that shows that a little bit better? Yes, I do. On the grain bins here? It uh, breaks it down and uh, it makes it appear as though there uh, isn't as much as what a lot of people are led to believe. Now on this item here, uh, you'll note that the top figures, uh, the soybeans in supply, 160 million bushel as of September 1, right prior to the harvest of the 1968 crop. Uh, the wheat in supply, July 1, just prior to the wheat harvest of uh, 537 million bushel and uh, the corn supply of October 1, just prior to the 1968 uh, harvest, was 1,150,000,000 bushel. Well, this looks as a tremendous amount if you're not in a position to price it or handle it, and therefore it's considered surplus. Now to take another look at it, if farmers start pricing their products and turn that arrow around, and you change it to inventory, and at that point, figuring normal disappearance, you have about a two-month supply of beans and about a four-and-a-half-month supply of wheat and about a three-month supply of corn. Now, this may seem like a quite a little to some people if they were trying to do away with it in a few days' time, but figuring crop conditions and all of this nature, it's actually uh, a moderate reserve. Then another token, if you start pricing uh, livestock and uh, some of the imports get shut off and we have to produce that, in this country, it wouldn't take long to move through this grain supply. And this is actually the only form of holding a surplus in the United States is in these grain bins, surplus or inventory. Right. And there's just such little difference between a surplus and inventory. That's putting a price tag on it. Now, talking about having to produce some of the meat, I'd like to point out that America hasn't produced enough red meat to feed their own people since prior to 1950. In 1968, we bought 19% of all the red meat in the world that was for sale. The United States of America did. Now, if we were to produce that meat, most certainly your inventory of grain wouldn't last very long. Supposing a war would come along and the meat supply would be cut off. It has been in the past. We'd need all this grain immediately to produce that meat, to feed our own people. And, and under normal conditions, not creating, uh, not uh, figuring any, any movement so far as a war of this nature. If uh, the only reason that imports are coming into the country today is because there is a demand for them. The farmers put themselves in a position to price their product. At that point, anything that is imported over and above what is needed it has a price depressing effect to the consumer. So at that point, the, the Im imports into this country will be governed by the retail outlet, so as to not interfere with their ability to price it to the consumer. In other words, what they do bring in then won't be used to break the farmer's price. Right. It won't be possible. Mm -hmm. Now we're shipping out the grain, breaking the grain price, shipping back in the meat, and breaking the meat price, and the farmer suffers both ways. Now, Ken, uh, let's, let's get into price for foreign trade. Just a little bit here. Well, Butch, this has been an area that uh, I think has opened up an avenue of tremendous interest for our listening audience. We've always been told, of course, that we had to compete uh, in world markets. Well, I want to point out some world markets here. Here it gives a breakdown of a bushel of wheat produced in South Dakota. The producer in South Dakota receives a dollar twenty-seven cents for it, and. Uh, the local dealer uh, gets five cents for it, and six cents is transportation to a warehouse, 11 cents is transportation to the uh, foreign country, and 38 cents is transportation to the Gulf port. Now, if you add all this up and then consider the 
price of wheat in a foreign market or the country or the city of Rotterdam, one of the common market countries over there, their domestic price level for wheat is approximately three dollars and forty two cents a bushel versus the dollar twenty seven cents here in the United States. Now the difference between the transportation costs and what it costs the producer or the what the producer receives here is subtracted from their domestic price support level over there. So that leaves a dollar and fifty five cents approximately in tariffs or import duties charged by that foreign country before they will let this bushel of wheat get into their economy. <laughs> In other words, if we had our price up there, we wouldn't have to pay that tariff, is it there right? Wouldn't, there wouldn't be any need for as high a tariff, even under their variable levy system, there wouldn't be a need for as high a tariff as what is now being presently charged. And I think that the answer lies in increasing the domestic price level here on our bushel of wheat to compare more with the $3.42 price that the foreign markets have. Ken, this is exactly what the common market has been telling us. For the last five or six years now, they've sent official representatives to Corning, Iowa, to meet with the National Farmers Organization because they're vitally interested in what we're trying to do to raise the prices. They pointed out that they would be better off if we raised our prices. The farmers themselves and the government over there uh, would be better off because they wouldn't have to subsidize their farmers as much. In fact, what they would like to do to raise the price structure of agriculture clear around the world. They pointed out that many of the regions didn't have the money to pay it anyway, and they proposed, just like we proposed to do, to put on the market what we can, they can consume at a price and then give it to the rest of the world if they have to or work out some method whereby and but raise their standard of living by raising the prices on the farm commodities they do produce. Well, there's definitely a movement going on over there now to break down that kind of a protection system that they have in there. And of course, uh, the farmers in Europe certainly don't want to see that happen. And but rather would see that the uh, big supplier or the world market supply of most agriculture commodities for export uh, have a similar type system. And the only way you can do it is through effective organization any longer, because the Department of Agriculture, unfortunately, hasn't paid too good attention to farmers and protecting farmers price-wise as far as world markets are concerned. Well, this gets us into farm organization. Why don't you comment on this, this subject just for a moment? Well, this is interesting, too, uh, because actually there is a, absolutely no competition between NFO and the other major farm organizations. For example, how does NFO fit in with the other farm organizations, such as the Farm Bureau, or the Farmers Union, or the National Grange? Well, these organizations perform services for their members through legislation and uh, also service cooperatives. Uh, they have insurance programs. They're servicing their members through uh, cooperatives. And this is needed. Uh, the farmers need this service. But there has, hasn't been, up until NFO came along, there hasn't been any organization, or wasn't, any organization to perform the service of bargaining for the purpose of getting a price for the production grown on farms before it left the farm. And NFO was born strictly out of this need. And uh, so there is no competition between farm organizations structurally wise. And we don't ask the members of other organizations to desert those organizations, but to only join NFO for the purpose of getting a price for that production before it leaves the farm and bargain for it uh, before it does leave their gate. And uh, so it fits in very well with the other farm organizations. And uh, we have a lot of uh, cross uh, membership uh, with all the other general farm organizations. I've often said that I don't believe the producers of America are going to leave their bargaining power to the government, who's had since the 30s to get farmers a price and haven't yet. But neither do I believe they're going to leave it to other farm organizations who had nearly 40 years to make use of the Capra Falstead Act before the NFO came along. So it's a case of joining together, bargain together. Now, Leroy, let's talk a little bit about collective bargaining. Well, I've, uh, uh, I got a picture here that we've designed in very simple terms, and I'm sure the people are accustomed to it. You go into your supply and demand factors and the amount that is needed for, uh, needed for getting a price. Up here, you see a farmer uh, overhauling his tractor. 
Well, let's assume that while he is doing this, uh, he twists off and all of a sudden establishes a demand for four head bolts. He comes into town and he has two local dealers and they have two pricing systems. One here has three in a bin at a dollar each. Another one has uh, three over here in a package. They're grouped together and he will sell the three for five dollars. The sensible way to get the supply that he needs, what he has the demand for, is to buy the three for five dollars and get the remaining one from the unorganized at one dollar each. Therefore, uh, the farmers who have put their production together into the package for uh, selling it are the ones that are establishing the price on that item. And within the organization, the membership agreement of the NFO, the entire governing structure of it is operated by the members and all of the terms of packaging, uh, conditions of selling and pricing is in the, at the option of the producer members. Other words, one of the bargaining power is going to get a price for their product and then they're going to buy the remaining supply from somebody else, right? This is, uh, this is the way it would appear at the time. How about the supply contracts there? Well, I'll just touch on them briefly, Butch, and that is uh, where uh, the one thing we want to bear in mind is this not, is not our uh, original ultimate goal. Uh, uh, of course, this is master contracts that will reflect the cost of production plus a reasonable profit. But at the present time, we are in supply contracts now, marketing livestock, grain, dairy production, just about all items of farm production. And generally, the members are deriving a better price. This is not the goal of the NFO, and you might compare it to uh, a football game. And that is it steps toward the original goal, but we're going into huddles and designing each play and moving forward with these supply contracts. Uh, one individual from the Deep South explained it quite humorously. Uh, these supply contracts are definitely not all that we want in the NFO, but it sure beats going to the marketplace and saying, what will you give me? Absolutely. And speaking of football games, there's another one here, football teams, that brings it out real well, I think. Uh, the football team is there, and the organized farmer is out in front. The processors, the government, everybody else is out to take over agriculture. And the captain at the top says, loose ball. Down below it says, who's going to control farming? This is the real battle, folks. Who's going to control farming? Will it be the organized farmers, the NFO farmers? It most certainly will be, Ken. There's no question about it, but what block bargaining and block selling through the NFO is going to get the job done. Legislation will not be successful. Congressman Okonski, who's been trying to pass legislation for farmers for nearly 30 years, says that farmers unite or perish. Collective bargaining is the key to the farmer's success. The American farms and ranches can survive through the NFO collective bargaining program, which is being recognized as the number one collective bargaining group for American agriculture. U.S. Farm Report has presented as special guest Ken Stoffern, director of NFO field staff department, and Leroy Kanaz, NFO field staff assistant. Doing the questioning was W.W. W. Butch Swaim, director of NFO public information. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week at the same time for more facts on agriculture and rural America, which is a gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. The farm income pattern sets the nation's true prosperity level, and the National Farmers Organization represents new thinking and a new generation of agricultural producers. A brighter day for American agriculture.